Uh, we're happy to have you all here for this Talking History evening. Uh, many of you I know, but um, my name is Penny Wright. I'm the program coordinator at the Rogers Memorial Library. And on behalf of all of us at the library, I'd like to welcome you here this evening. I'd like to thank the friends of the library for their support of our programs. And I'd like to thank the village of Southampton, who is represented here by Howard McElroy, I see, the village clerk, uh, for allowing us to use this beautiful room for our several of our talking history evenings. Mostly taxpayers. That's right. We can thank ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> if we live in the village. <laughs> Okay, we would also like to invite any of you who are interested in uh, hearing about, learning more about future programs or in becoming a member of the Friends of the Library to fill out a handy little card. After we finish this evening, we have refreshments and we hope you'll join us for those as well. Finally, we'd like to thank our volunteer hostess, Gina Ann Valenti, who greeted you as you came in. We'd like to thank Dorothy Riley for being our camera person this evening. And before we begin, I'd also like to tell you that on March 30th, which is a Saturday at 3 o'clock, we're going to be having a concert at the Parish Memorial Hall on Herrick Road. <clears throat> and it's a concert of songs sung by the people who you've been listening to as you walked in. It's going to be a wonderful concert, Songs of the Sea. We hope to see each of you here <laughs> that day. There's no admission charge, but if you'd like to come, please call and make a reservation. We'd be happy to see you all there. Actually, I have a sign-up sheet so you can sign up after the program. Tonight is a very special evening in our Talking History series because we're going to take a look at the lives and the livelihoods of four men who make their living on the water. Thirty-five years ago, there were almost 200 men in the town of Southampton making their livings on the bays. Today, there are fewer than 25. The good news is that 25% of them are here with us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to share a little bit about what their lives are like. I'd like to introduce our first guest, who is the person sitting next to me, and he's the one who's responsible for convincing these other bay men <laughs> to come in and be here with us this evening. His name is Wayne Grothy. Wayne grew up in Quag, and although he didn't come from a fishing family, he grew up loving the water, and he's been fishing for a living since 1975. Today, he catches a wide variety of fish and shellfish. In addition to his work as a bayman, Wayne is active in the Southampton Baymen's Association, and is doing work to preserve the quality of our local waters. Please join me in welcoming him. <laughs> to Wayne's left is Ken Mays. Ken grew up in Hampton Bays in a family which has been living in the East End for three and a half centuries and began working as his father and grandfather had before him on the bays as a small child, helping his father during the summers and after school with the routine chores of fishing. Mr. Mays attended local schools, then decided to pursue a career in finance, working on Wall Street for an investment brokerage firm for five years. Then left in 1963 to return to the East End to fish, and he's been doing that ever since. I guess he thought the idea of making money wasn't that attractive. Made <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you> so <laughs> much. <laughs> We're really pleased that he's agreed to be with us this evening, and please welcome him. <laughs> Next to Ken is Sam Rispoli. Unlike our other guests, Sam grew up in Queens, attended schools in Manhattan, and began working on the water during the summer of his freshman year in college. Like the others, however, he had always loved to fish and had many early memories of sport fishing with his grandfather and his father. In 1980, he moved to Hampton Bays with his family and began clamming, eeling, and scalloping on Shinnecock and Peconic Bays. In 1986, he spent a year working in Montauk on a lobster boat, then returned to Hampton Bays where he's been fishing, primarily lobstering, ever since. 
Ken, thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Sam. Our last guest this evening volunteer, volunteered to be here at the last minute when Howard Pickerel wasn't able to join us, and his name is Ed White. Ed White is the great-great-grandson of a whaling captain, and his family has been fishing and farming for many generations. He attended local schools, then remained here on the East End, where he's been fishing for over 20 years. In the 1960s, Ed White did haul seining in the ocean with his father. Now he does commercial clamming and has a small landscaping business, which helps him stay afloat. <laughs> no pun intended. Like the others, Ed is active in the Baymans Association. Thanks, Ed, very much for being here. I'd like to begin by sort of going down the, with the group here and asking each of you to tell us a little bit about what kind of an operation you have and, uh, you know, what you fish for and what sort of folks you have. And can we start with you, Wayne? Yes. Uh, yeah. Before I start, I'd just like to thank Penny Wright. She put a lot of effort into this. And, uh, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, as Penny mentioned, I started fishing about 20 years ago. Uh, I was laid off from my job, and I thought it would be a good way to make you know, ends meet, and uh, I never went back to my job. Uh, I fish out of a small boat, about 20 foot long. It's uh, flat bottom, very stable, and very heavy. Uh, I shellfish for clams, scallops, uh, soft clams, mussels. I pot fish, I pot conks. Uh, the last couple of years, I've been trying to grow oysters on a mariculture project in Peconic Bay. Uh, I feel it's one way that I'll be able to uh, make ends meet in the future. Um, as Penny had said, the, uh, the amount of baymen uh, has dwindled down because the amount of, of product and the water quality has uh, diminished. So we're all up against... Uh, very hard time there. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thanks. How about you, Tim? Yes, sir. I've been fishing full time since 1963, and my operation primarily now is a fish trap and, and fight net uh, fishing operation. I don't do all that much shell fishing anymore, but I occasionally fill in with it. Um, my year really starts in say about mid-January, and, and I start with my bike nets, which are, which are underwater traps, which we set for winter flounder exclusively, and uh, fish those until about uh, the third week in March, and remove those from the bays, and at that time, I begin to install my pound nets for the spring fishing, the fish traps, and uh, they're large structures, they're, oh, the leaders are about 500 feet long. I have a diagram here of what a pound net looks like. And, uh, whoops, whoops. The lead starts all about 50 feet from the shore and runs out to a length of about 500 feet to the deep water. And at that point, we have our first entrapment, which is called the hearts of the net. And the hearts go into a, a second set of hearts and then into the pound itself. And uh, it kind of works like this, really. Uh, this is 500 feet long. The hearts are about 50 feet long on each side. The parlor is, oh, about 12 feet by, 20, by 24 feet. And it happens kind of like this. Th th this is a bluefish. <laughs> he's, he's very nervous. He's never done this in front of all these people. <laughs> right? But if he happens to swim along the shore like this and he hits this fence that this darn Bayman put out here, and uh, if, if, it's, uh, if it's his lucky day, he'll just turn, maybe turn around and go back the way he came. If it's my lucky day, he'll follow that lead into the hearts, and when he gets to the trap itself, he might not like that because he sees all that dark enclosure of webbing and everything, and he might run back around in the hearts into the return and back and two or three times before he works his way into the second set of hearts and then eventually through the funnel. And once he's in there, 
<laughs> he, he's probably not going to get out. No, he, he's mine at that point. And, and at that point there, after I lift the trap to the top and get all the fish pursed up in one corner, this is the tool that we use. We tie the boat up alongside of the poles of the structure, and uh, that's where he goes, right in there. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then into the boat along with what else, whatever else that I've caught for that day, and that could include fluke, flounders, weak fish, butterfish, porgies, blue claw crabs, eels, uh, occasionally, uh, occasionally striped bass, and and, and, other, and other species also. Anything that comes into our bays is liable to wind up in a pound net at one time or another, you know. So uh, that's, that's the main tool of the trade, once that the traps are installed, you know. And, and those traps until about the middle of June. And after the middle of June, we are required by Southampton Town Law to remove them from the waters for the summer season until after Labor Day mm -hmm. because of boat traffic problems and whatever. And uh, we put them back in, oh, right after Labor Day and fish them right up until the first week in December. And then from there on, we're putting everything away until it's time to start the pike fishing and the cycle starts all over again. Thanks. I want to ask you more questions about that in just a few okay. minutes. Let's go on with Sam for a moment. Evening, everyone. Hi. Um, I started working on the water in 1973. Uh, mostly hard clamming out of Babylon. Uh, once I started hard clamming, uh, it was every bit of what the name implies. It was a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. And uh, back then, um, eel population on Long Island in the South Shore Bays uh, was fairly substantial. And quite a few of the people working on the bays at the time would supplement their clamming uh, by trapping eels or dredging eels in the winter. So uh, I set out uh, and did a little eel potting in the first few years that I worked on the water. Um, during the winter time, we pursued the eels also uh, when they would hibernate in the mud. And we would do what was called uh, dredging for eels, where we'd find where they would nest down and uh, with uh, different types of tools, we would catch them while they were buried in the mud. Um, I worked out of Babylon until 19... 80 when I moved out to uh, Hampton Bays. Um, we bought a home, my wife and I, and uh, began clamming and scalloping in Shinnecock Bay. Um, at the present time, uh, as the clam population decreased and uh, things got a little bit tougher working on the bay itself, uh, I started um, working for other people. I started working on a lobster boat in Montauk. And eventually, I bought my own lobster boat. And uh, currently, I fish out of Mattituck in the Sound for lobsters. That's my primary source of income. But during the winter and, uh, and the spring, I do come back to the bay to go clam the scallop. And uh, that's where I am mm -hmm. right now. Thank you. Ed, how about you? Yeah. Well, like Penny said before, in the uh, late 60s, I did haul signing with my father. and. Uh, we had good many good years, but uh, they banned us of taking striped bass, which was the real money money fish, so we had to give it up. And uh, I always liked to clam, and uh, so I went back to that, you know, and uh, it, I've been doing that ever since then. Uh, it's, it's a rough way of making a living, but you can make good money if you really put your mind to it put a full day in. Uh, my family, like Penny was saying, is, you know, comes from whaling, fishing, and farming. I have a, have a picture here of my great-great-grandfather. He was a whaling captain. He worked at a uh, Cold Spring Harbor. There's Cold Spring Harbor Whaling Company there. And he went out on uh, four voyages um, on three different ships. And he would be gone at times 22 months, 20, 29 months at a time. And it must have been rough on family life, being <laughs> one animal. <laughs> but, uh, What's his name, White? Yes, yeah, Eli White. Eli White. Yeah, Eli White. And it looks like he had a bad hair day. That day. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I. 22 months. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have a perk then, I guess. <laughs> 
but uh, actually, when I was a, a child, I grew up in the house that he built. Um, and we had to sell it because it was over 100 years old. And uh, there was so much, to, you know, to get it back to, you know, good shape. So we sold it. It's still standing. It's on Flying Point Road in Watermel. Um, someday, if I win lotto, I think I'll try and buy it back. Because <laughs> <laughs> people that bought it, they really fixed it up nice. So I'd like to get it back in the family if I could. Uh, it's passed around. Can you show us what else you brought there? Yeah, well, here's uh, a painting of one of the ships. This, this was Tuscarora. Um, I guess one of the mates painted it after they had a real bad storm, the mass and everything all ripped up. And uh, it's it's in a you know pretty good description of what it looked like. I'll pass that around. <coughs> And also I have here, it's a, a sketch of a hall signing, how, how we did, you know, did it in the good years there. Did you do it on the off the ocean, off the yeah. shore? Yeah, in Southampton Village we do it. We even traveled to, on the west side of the Shinnecock Inlet and work over there. Mm -hmm. All the way to East Ham we would go. And they've got some crews still do it in East Ham. And but they don't, they can't go after striped bass. They go after uh, bluefish and wheatfish now. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a, definitely a dying industry. Do you foresee that the catching of striped bass will be allowed again at some point, or is that? It is allowed, but not by the yeah. whole Oh, not yeah. by the whole things. Yeah, the, the state and um, I guess we call it the sports fishermen don't. They think that's a wrong way of uh, catching striped bass. They call it dirty fishing because when we bring the fish in, they get sand on them. And some of them, you know, die pretty quick and they feel like the small ones that we throw back are dying. But if you get them back in the water within, you know, five, ten minutes, they're all right. Yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the main problem that, that they have about <coughs> having the whole sand. Mm -hmm. yeah. But maybe someday and they might let it come back. Mm -hmm. It's a social conflict more than anything, really. Right. Yeah. right. And here's uh, what Ken, you know, how he does the pound trap and biking. Here's some more pictures of it. Okay. Yeah. To spend a few minutes just backtracking on the uh, trap fishing, um, Ken, uh, you seem to know a lot about trap fishing. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of design of that trap? I mean. How long have people been fishing that way? For centuries, um, all around the world, the basic same design with slight variations. <coughs> Almost any culture that you go to that fishes, fishes a similar design trap is, is the trap design that Ed has passed around that he took the copy from Men's Lives. And the trap net and the fight net uh, in, that, in, that photo, in that picture there, that diagram, are very similar wherever you go. You go to Maine and they have their herring wares, which are, uh, they're much larger, but uh, the principle's the same. The fish follow the lead to the, till they get to the deep and then they work their way into the impoundment and, and at that point they're trapped. Their natural instinct, when, when a fish hits a barrier that he wants to get around, his natural instinct is to follow it to the deep. And when they follow it to the deep, they work their way into the, into the enclosure and at that point they're trapped. When the first Europeans came here, was that kind of fishing being done by the, the Native Americans? The, <coughs> fight, the, the fight net that's in that diagram, those, that very same type of net was here. The same, the same knot was used to make the meshes that, were, that the Europeans had used in Europe. And uh, in anywhere in the world that nets were made, fishing nets were made, the same same knot was used, whether these cultures had any contact or over the centuries or not. It, it was the one that they worked out that worked the best, you know. But they found nets that I believe that are thousands of years old, and they use the same knot that's used today, and they used everywhere. Hmm. Yeah. Did you have something uh, to say, Wayne? I'd like to ask something about I've been trapped fishing with Ken. <laughs> some occasions and uh, I was amazed at what a clean fishery it is uh, anything that's undersized 
or illegal to take, or everything is returned right to the water, completely unharmed. Uh, it's uh, a, a very good way to, you know, environmentally good way to catch fish. Mm -hmm. There is there is no bycatch in that fishery. Anything that anything that you do not harvest that you return um, is alive and unharmed. <coughs> What is this actual, what are the dimensions of that? The oven? leads, the leads are usually four or five hundred feet long, and uh, the trap itself is, our traps for Shinnecock Bay are about 24 feet by 12 feet wide by 24 feet long by about 12 feet deep. Um, they don't go to the bottom. They do go to the bottom, yes, the entire structure. It's, it's set on, you know, the poles go right. out and the webbing is all attached, and the lead the lead in the hearts have lead lines. There's about 500 pounds of lead on, on each trap to hold it down the, on, the, on the leader and on the uh, on, on the leader and on the hearts. And the trap itself is tied to the poles on the top, and there's a series of pull downs that pull it down to the bottom on the bottom of each pole where the where the pole uh, is on the edge on the on the bottom. Did you say that this, uh, the place where they assemble, is called the parlor? This is where they wind up in the parlor, yes. <laughs> I like that name. Mm -hmm. Do you make your own trails? Yes, sure. Yeah. Can't buy them. And what materials <laughs> is the net? Nylon, the net? Webbing. Nylon webbing. Nylon webbing. Yeah. Now, how do you, do you get permission to set up a trap, sort of, if you want to set one up in Shinnecock Bay or Peconic Bay, do you have to apply for a permit to, yes. to, to set it out there? Yes, they're all on permit basis. Uh, they have to be 500 feet apart minimum. They have to be 1,000 feet from the next person who's setting a trap. And um, we have a, a, se a closed season during the summer months in Southampton Town. And uh, they must be at least 50 feet from any marked channel. So they close the season so that presumably boaters can... Yes, it was something that we kind of gave into quite a few years ago. Um, there, were, there was a lot of pressure from the rowboat stations. There were a lot of rowboat liveries back in the 50s and early 60s. And um, funny thing about that, most of the most of the boat livery people were people who had moved out here and gone into that business. They weren't mostly natives, and they thought that they were competing. We were competing directly against their business, and they put a lot of pressure on us to to uh, not be there in the summer to catch fish. And at that time. We thought that that was fine. It wasn't a peak fishing time anyway. Uh, pound nets fish best during migrations, you know, spring and fall, during the summer months when, when fish don't have, aren't moving around very much. They're not actually going anywhere. You know, they don't trap well because their instinct is not to follow the lead unless they're trying to get around that structure, you know. Uh, when they're migrating, they're actually going somewhere. And if they run into an obstruction, they will follow it as far as they have to go to get around. Mm -hmm. So we decided that, okay, fine, if uh, the boaters think that we shouldn't be there and the, the rowboat operators, rowboat station uh, operators don't think we should be there, maybe we'll do something else in the summer. We agreed to that. Mm -hmm. we, we still have no problem with okay. that. What do you do in the summer? Fish in another way or go clamming, whatever. You know, I work on the water. I find something to do. Yeah. Um, Sam, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what a typical day or is there a typical day in the life of a lobster fisherman? Well, all right. The, the lobster fishery itself uh, has a lot of peaks and valleys. Uh, there are certain times of the year when the lobster fishing is more productive, and that's when you press harder. But um, the industry itself uh, demands a lot of, of uh, work other than the actual catching of the lobster. There's a lot of maintenance. There's a lot of trap building and repair. Um, and you actually get to spend quite a bit of time at home, mm -hmm. especially during the winter months. Um, but on a typical day during the summer when the, uh, the fishing is at its peak, um, get up in the morning at approximately 3.30, go to pick up the bait, which I uh, <coughs> make arrangements for the day before, and I keep it in the, uh, in the fish mark in a refrigerated cooler, and head up to Mattatuck, load the boat, and uh, during the summer months, my son works with me uh, when he's home from school. And uh, we try to get off the dock by 5.30, quarter to 6. And uh, it takes us about an hour to get out to where the gear is set, and we start to haul traps. 
on an average day we may pull somewhere between 250 and 275 traps. Uh, and it takes us quite a good part of the day. And we usually get back into the dock somewhere around 4 o'clock. Just in time boat. to go to bed? <laughs> no, I try and uh, not sleep on the way home. <laughs> this year I'll be a little bit luckier because my son will have his driver's license and he'll be able to drive. <laughs> and on the way home we sell lobsters, uh, line up our bait for the next day. And Where do you home. sell your lobsters? Most of my lobsters go uh, to Hampton Bay's to Core JC Seafood. Uh, I've been dealing with Jimmy ever since I moved out here, whether it was lobsters or clams or scallops or whatever. Um, I like dealing with the same individual. Uh, he's good to me, and I guess he depends on, on what I catch to keep his business going. It's a good relationship. Mm -hmm. Is it, does the size of your catch vary from day to day with each of you? Or? Yeah. yeah. It, it definitely does. From day to day, with, <coughs> from one day to the next? Yes, the weather is uh, probably the biggest factor. How would the weather affect? Well, like, uh, let's say if I'm scalloping or something and the wind's blowing 40 miles an hour, it's uh, very difficult and the dredges are you know, coming off the bottom, so mm -hmm. the catch is a, a lot less. Uh, Kenny, for instance, uh, if he doesn't have wind, the fish don't move, so he doesn't have anything in his traps. Okay. Uh, Sam, uh, mm -hmm. most of the season. like a box of chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we never know. Uh, you know, I mean, we were asked for a bank loan, and we were to say, well, what do you make uh, each week, or what do you make each day or each month? We don't know what we're going to make tomorrow. None of us. We, we never know what we're going to make the following day. We know that if we persevere and, and that if we hopefully put the knowledge that we've gained over the years to work, and uh, we do everything that we're supposed to do it and stay disciplined, it will be okay, we think. Have you ever been pleasantly surprised and just caught many more fish than you ever dreamed that you'd yes, catch on, sure. on a particular day? Yes, definitely. A lot of times it's a feast of famine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you, cannot, you cannot live by what you made this year even. You know, it's like, in that respect, it's like farming. I mean, uh, you might have one good year and one very good year, a very terrible year, and a mediocre year, you know, in, in that order or the other way around, and you never know when that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So you have to live according to, uh, according to that. You have to spend that way. Are there many days during the season that you wouldn't go out, and if you wouldn't go out, tell me, I, I'd like to hear a little bit about why. What kind of conditions would make you really stay home? Well, personally, <laughs> personally myself, uh, I don't go out in electrical storms. That's, mm -hmm. I just <laughs> forget that, I don't do that. <clears throat> uh, other than that, unless it's, you know, like a small hurricane, I'll, I'll try to get out. Do you go out in snow? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Snow, sleet, rain, rain. Yes, Any, no. anything but anything but 45 to 50 knot winds, and uh, I'm terrified of electrical storms. I've seen them hit buoys, I've seen them hit docks, I've seen them hit everything. <laughs> and they're frightening on it. When, out there, you see what they do. Right. <laughs> and I, I'll go ashore if there's an electrical storm. Do you know any, you know, have you had friends or acquaintances who been killed um, fishing? I, I saw two people uh, electrocuted before. Mm -hmm. There was one occasion where my father and I uh, launched the boat and it was real rough weather and uh, I thought it was my time then. It was, uh, we got through one wave and the second wave broke right in front of the boat and uh, filled it about a quarter of the way filled with water and kept going and the next wave broke in the front of the boat, and that was halfway through, it filled with water, and my father said to me, if the next one breaks in the boat, we're going to have to jump jump overboard, you know. Sure enough, it did break over the front of the boat, and we jumped over to the left, and meanwhile, the boat flipped over to the right, and we, you know, we wear these waders, and really, they're the, the worst things to wear, but, and uh, by the time I made it to shore, the waders were Completely filled with water. I couldn't even stand up. Luckily, we were right on the beach, you know, when it happened. And uh, 
that was an experience oh, yeah. 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 so it, it took us like five hours to straighten the net it was this one big pool you know and the boat had a big crack in it we had to work on that for a couple of days i bet i bet that was enough to really shake you up yeah it sure was yeah. what i i know we talked a little bit about safety equipment I was a little bit surprised at your answer. But what can you tell us what kinds of equipment you carry or don't carry on the boat? Well, what do we mainly all have? A, we just must have a whistle, life preservers. You, are you required to carry? Yeah, yes. the Coast Guard. Yeah. A whistle, like. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who's going to throw me the light was there. The fish. But, uh, well, uh, on the sound and, and in some of the larger boats now, it's common for fellas to have uh, a cellular phone. Mm -hmm. um, mainly because even though you may have a VHF or CB radio on the boat, um, if you have an electrical problem with the boat uh, or the radio goes down, or if no one else is out, uh, listening to the radio, you know, you can't get in touch with anyone. So uh, cellular phones have been very popular lately. Mm -hmm. Christmas for my wife. <laughs> but he said he hardly ever turns it off. I don't know. <laughs> when outgoing calls on. When you fish in the bays, though, you're in an enclosed body of water. I call us dog bark fishermen. We don't fish so far from shore we can't hear a dog bark. You know, we don't need the same safety equipment you know we can we can get ashore we might not get to the shore we'd like to get to but we can get ashore do any of you have dogs that you take care you know uh, it's color? illegal yeah, yeah, illegal. Illegal. yeah the conservation don't want, doesn't want you to have it afraid that the, you know the dog doesn't have a bathroom you might uh, make oh, a mistake I no? <laughs> um Wayne, could you t talk for a few minutes and tell us just a little bit about your oyster project? Oh, uh, two years ago, I decided to try to marigold or grow oysters in Peconic Bay. Uh, I purchased these oysters from, uh, like, Blue Point Oyster Company or Flowers in Oyster Bay. Uh, they're about six millimeters, which is, you know, about that big. And... Uh, <coughs> The trick is to try to get them to the legal size within two years. I pay about a penny a piece for the small oysters. Uh, two, years, two years ago, legal oysters were worth about 38 cents. So, you know, you can get a 50% return on them, you know, of mortality. So I don't, uh, it would definitely be a you know, help. I, I think that some of the baymen uh, are starting to move, you know, to become farmers rather than... Uh, hunters and gatherers, as you know, if you want to call it that. And I, I think it might be uh, a very good way to supplement all our incomes. Mm -hmm. Brown tide, though. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They, didn't, they didn't, no growth during the brown tide period, right? No. Right. No. no. Didn't grow a bit. I, I noticed that you mentioned that, uh, and I remember when we had our farming evening, that just about all the farmers said that it was pretty necessary to diversify to keep in business and do you pretty much feel the same way uh, I think if you look at everyone here tonight uh, we all do many different things uh, you just can't survive by uh, being a scalloper or a clammer or even a fish trapper like you know, Ken. Um, all the stocks of all the species are down so it's like pick away at the most opportune time and uh, that's how you have to try to make a living now. Do you eat fish a lot? Mm -hmm. Or clams? And clams. Yeah. Lobsters? Fish, uh, <laughs> eat fish twice a week, sometimes mm -hmm. three times. Yeah, I do also. One of our big problems is, uh, well, it's, we have 15 creeks uh, in Southampton Town on the comic side. And out of the 15, only three are open year-round. Uh, the state uh, has all the rest closed in the summer months. They feel that the bacteria level is uh, too high. It's they, they mainly do it for coarsens reasons. It's, it's really not as bad as they make it out to be. But just for them to be safe, they close them. And 
they have these what we, they call seasonal or conditional areas that are open. These creeks that are closed are open in the winter. They're seasonal, conditional. And uh, the, the best clamming areas for us because, you know, they rest during the summer months and get to spawn. And then we go, you know, and harvest in the winter and do, do really good. And that, but for them to, to close all them, that's made me do, you know, venture out into landscaping. I've been doing that for about 10 years now. So it works out good for me, but a lot of the payment it doesn't. You know, I, I landscape in the summer months, and then December 1st, they open these areas, and I can work all winter doing that. But the guys that do strictly clamming all, all year long, they really, they struggle in the summer months, because all these areas are closed. Mm -hmm. Have you seen, <clears throat> over the last 20 years, have you seen a shift in the number of species or kinds of fish that you catch that you see? There's a decline in almost everything, not in the species. I, I don't see any species disappearing. I see a, a drastic decline. Uh, really, the, the last decade has been the most serious decline, and, and fishing has become so industrialized world, worldwide that, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're in an extraction industry and we develop tools that will extract faster than nature can reproduce, you know, and, uh, you know, bigger and bigger boats and in pursuit following the fish wherever they go, they don't get any rest at all, uh, is, is being worked on. I, I'm involved with a lot of management uh, uh, programs and there's going to be a lot more restriction, there's more, more regulation coming down almost by the month. Uh, I think that uh, probably the, the large, the fleets of large boats are going to be reduced somewhat. But what is a real major problem is the estuaries of Long Island and, the, and practically the whole East Coast. Uh, the water quality has degraded to the point to where fish do not reproduce nearly as successfully as they used to. Uh, we always hear about the impact of brown tide on shellfish, scallops in particular. Uh, when we had the three horrendous years of brown tide, 85, 86, and 87, recruitment of every single species that spawns in these bays for those three years was almost non-existent. The seagrass beds, because the grasses couldn't photosynthesize, we got down, down to a depth of about that deep, and uh, it total darkness down there, and not enough light and the seagrass beds all die. Now the fry of every species, they live that first year, they need that habitat, they need that cover, just like the, the, the rabbit or the ground nesting bird needs that briar patch, you know, to, to hide from predators. Uh, fry finfish need that cover also. They, they must have that. If they're out where they're exposed, the predators literally get them all. It's hard, it's hard to imagine that, but it, it is a fact. Mm -hmm. And the pound nets are excellent indicators. During the fall months, we know how good a, a set of little weak fish we had or, or flounders we had or, or little butterfish or blowfish or, I know, I could go on and on. Uh, dur during that time period, when we had it the worst, we saw no fry of any kind on all of Long Island and every pound net that, every pound net that I talked to said the same thing. Up and fish recruited the, the grasses came back quite quickly. Fish recruited themselves right away. It got better, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, now we went back into a pretty bad brown tide situation again last year. And uh, it, it's it's very worrisome. It, th this is a problem that no one really understands what's causing it. We're probably causing it. There's probably too many of us here in between runoff and all and all the other things that we put in the water. Uh, the, the, we shouldn't. Uh, I, I, I think we've got to do something. The town has had the stormwater abatement uh, program, which Wayne was responsible really for getting underway, and uh, that is going to help somewhat. But common sense tells me, without any further study, that we have to keep everything that common sense tells us doesn't belong in our bays out wherever possible. Mm -hmm. Wherever possible. Could we go through for a couple of minutes uh, and sort of just talk about 
what you see, I'm going to ask you, Wayne, right now, because I know you've been involved in this, about really the biggest threats to the quality of water. In uh, Southampton, over the last 15 years, we've had really extensive development along the shorelines. Uh, and prior to that, uh, the development was also very heavy, and the zoning is uh, some of the smallest plots, you know, are on the shorelines because it was the most desirable land. What I would like to see in uh, the town of Southampton, I would like to see an upgrade of all the sewage residential septic systems on the shorelines. Uh, a lot of them are, are antiquated uh, prior to 1976, and uh, basically they leach directly into the bays. Uh, another uh, very important uh, program would be to declare all the waters in the town of Southampton a no discharge zone. And uh, the town is now working towards that goal. The town trustees uh, last year purchased five pump out boats, you know, to pump out the, uh, and, and I think that that would be a, a big help. Can and you tell us a little bit about what, what that would mean, no discharge zone? Well, uh, you can't. Uh, let your septic wastes uh, loose from the boats, you know, in the I water. See. Okay, now you can in, in places in the town. Uh, probably the, uh, the thing Kenny uh, mentioned before, the uh, stormwater abatement. We have, in the 30s and 40s, all the roads were engineered to run directly into the water because, you know, all the uh, rain, because that was the most efficient way to get rid of it and cheapest, uh, but it's also very environmentally damaging to the, to the bays. It picks up all the petrochemicals, you know, the antifreeze, uh, dog waste, pesticide, everything. Uh, in 1993, uh, the town passed the Clean Water Bond Act and they started to do uh, stormwater abatement. And I'd like to see that program continued also. That's about mm -hmm. what I'd like to see. Can you tell us, uh, Wayne, a few things that, that we we could do, or we that we shouldn't uh, do? Oh, what you shouldn't Apart do? Apart from not build a house on the ocean? No, no, I mean, uh, I, I think if, if you live on the water, you should voluntarily uh, establish a buffer zone between your lawn and the bay, instead of fertilizing all the way up to the bay, or using, you know, right, you know, having green grass right to the bay. I uh, have some natural uh, plants as a border that, that don't need to be fertilized, that don't need pesticides. Uh, when you're out boating, of course, don't throw plastics or sewage or gasoline or oil or anything like that in the water, of course. You should keep your outboards or inboards uh, tuned properly so that the exhaust isn't uh, laden with, you know, excess gas and oil. What uh, about marinas? How much, uh, uh, or is this controversial? It, it, it is kind of controversial. Uh, some are, some are well, very, very good, good citizens. Yes, you some know, are. Some are very good citizens, and uh, there's a more and more peer pressure to make the others be good citizens more yeah. all the, because, you know, they realize their boating industry depends on, on, a water, on, a water, on quality. water quality. Yeah. You know, our real estate values okay. depend on the water quality. You know, they have a vested interest. In Everyone it, so. has a vested interest, yeah. really. Do some people pump uh, pool water into the bays? Yeah, that's, that's a bad problem because then, you know, the, the water is treated with chlorine and once the chlorine gets into the, the water table, that whole area, it's just, it's in shock. It's all vegetation will be killed. Any larva, fish larva, clam larva, mm -hmm. it's, it's the worst thing that they can do. Yeah, there's a lot of that. But I think, um, there is a problem that maybe hasn't been explored. When I started clamming in Babylon, um, you couldn't find an area on the island that had any more shoreside development than that particular area. Every square inch of shoreline had a house on it, condominium departments. And uh, I'm sure that when those homes were built, they didn't have anywhere as near um, as advanced septic systems or pollution control that has been developed since then. Yet, uh, at that time, the clamming was very, very productive in Babylon, Bayshore, Islip, Lindenhurst. 
So, in the time period since then, the shellfish population, you know, at that time, Long Island supplied 75% or more of the country's entire hard clam production. Wow. Now, for some reason, these areas have all gone almost barren. It takes time, though, Sam. But it's possible that something has been introduced into the environment, some chemical or sub some sub substance, which um, is detrimental to the reproduction of the clam. That, that's a big bay up there, though, Sam, and it takes a long time. The bigger the body of water, the longer it takes to poison it. You know, it's it's, mm -hmm. it's larger. And I, I doubt that it'll ever come back to what it Oh, no, that's why I'm was, saying you know, something yeah. since that time period may have been introduced into the environment, which I think it's a, not I think it's a cumulative effect of years of time of everything going into the water. <laughs> I mean, it's possible. Yeah. <laughs> the, the chemistry has changed. Things are different. It, the, system, the natural system is not working nearly as well as it we, we can speculate all we want, and none of us know. But the chemistry is different, and the environment does not produce the fish or shellfish that it did. It, it, it just doesn't work as well. The system is not functioning like it used to. I mean, we see, we see species going down in population that no one fishes for. <laughs> You know, I mean, going down dramatically that no one fishes for. Is the problem being really studied? Um, it's being reported on, but is it yeah. being is it being well, studied? Well, Ken's talked about the uh, water chemistry changing. Uh, I personally believe that's the the cause of the brown tide. It Roger Tolson did a study, and he took samples right in front of where they, they pumped this out, you know, the nitrates, and it was equivalent to one ton of fertilizer a day going into the Tonic River. And it's a known fact that allergies thrive on nitrates. Um, I'm not saying that the brown tide is totally, I mean, that the, the sewer treatments are the total problem with it. The algae. The algae, to me, I agree with scientists that it came, it's an ocean algae, and it was introduced in our bays in 95, and uh, other bays got it, uh, Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island, there's a bay in New Jersey, and the, all the bays have sort of the same setup, you know, the, the 
kind of like a cone shape going up to a river. And uh, for some reason, this algae likes high salinity. And there's plenty of salt goes up into the conic. Yeah. And uh, it's like, I don't know, the state, we, we can control the, uh, the nitrates, pollution going in the water. We can't control the climate, the amount of the rain, you know, change the salinity, we can't change that. But we can, we can change, you know, what we're putting in the water. And I think it's time that the state makes it a law that no nitrates at all. But uh, the treatment plants should all have denitrification systems set up on it. And I hope they, they do that in the near future, because if we get it every every year, every other year, it's just the industry is just going to totally go down. It's going to go. It, it, it will. It, they will. The base will die. They will die. I mean, you, you can't. Even when, even when you, if you're going to have it for two or three years, every ten years, that's that's way too much. Right. Can't take that because under natural circumstances, uh, you can go three, four, five, six, seven years before you get a, a good set of clams or a good set of this or a good set of that. Or weak fish recruit themselves really well. You know, even if even if everything was left alone, if we weren't weren't even here, you know, we never fished for them. You know, and. When you throw, when you throw this problem in, it just stretches it out too much. It makes it too risky, and and the risk is also that you could even begin to lose some species because if you had a time period that ran too long, you could lose base columns. Period. You could lose them as a species. That's possible. Uh, possible. I'd like to add something. Kenny just talked about losing things as a species. Uh, Algae blooms just here on Long Island. Uh, that's not the case. It's happening all over, actually, all over the world in the last five years. And uh, in the Red Sea, they had an algae bloom that killed all the coral. It'll never be replaced. In the Adriatic. Yeah. And in North Carolina, this past, uh, not this past, two years ago, they had an algae bloom that, if you put your hand in the water, it was toxic to your nervous system. Um, there's been algae blooms all over the world, and uh, it's, it's, the scientists are concerned about it. It's, it they're not... Uh, We'd like to make one thing clear. Uh, brown tide does not affect us, you know. Like you can eat clams or yeah. whatever. <laughs> and there's, there's, there's nothing... Yeah. It's, it won't hurt you. Yeah. Has the consumption of fish uh, gone down over the last... gone up, gone down over the last 20 years? I think, it's, I think it's gone up yeah. um, because uh, the health benefits are still Right, people are understanding that, you know, fish it's is better for you, you know, it won't clog your arteries. Right. You know? yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to hear, um, talk about any really unusual kind of fish. Have you ever caught anything that really surprised you? Sure. That just didn't belong to <laughs> Well, I mean, first we'll talk about fish. And then we'll talk about other fish. <laughs> no, we'll just talk about fish. <laughs> I th one of the unusual catches I had in, in uh, my on nets in Chinnacock Bay, I had an ocean sunfish one time, and probably probably weighed about 300 pounds, oh. and uh, he could not get through. The funnel part of the trap, which, which is only about 18 inches by 18 inches, and was was in the uh, second set of hearts here. And here's this 300-pound fish in here, and how do I get it out? <laughs> how did you get it? Out? Well, I just dropped, I just untied the trap from the poles, and he swam over towards me, and they're very flat with a huge dorsal and pectoral fin. They're, they're as deep as they are long. They're, they're, and, and I just grabbed his dorsal and turned him sideways, and he kicked a little bit, and he swam right up over the swam right over the top of the net. You know, I had a 69-pound black drum once, which is a, a southern fish, which occasionally comes this far north. Um, Atlantic salmon occasionally, uh, brown trout, which a sea-run brown trout, which is really the Scottish salmon. Lump fish, which is a very strange guy with a little suction cup on the bottom that he can lock himself onto a rock. Edible? I don't think so. 
<laughs> Are there a lot he's, uh, of fish that he's you rather eat green eat <laughs> and lumpy? Uh -huh. <laughs> Has there... a texture about like an alligator. <laughs> <laughs> Are there many kinds of fish that you, that you wouldn't eat? No, not really. No, not really. There, there are a lot of tropical some falls, which get trapped here. They get swept up with the Gulf Stream and break out and come into these estuaries during the summer, and uh, they're all doomed. They, once the weather mm. turns cold, they just die. You know. How and about you? Uh, others of you? Uh, well, with the whole thing, and um, father and I one time had a whale in the net. Oh. <laughs> now we set the net out, and uh, as you know, the whales go underneath for quite a while, you know, and we didn't know he was coming along and set it out. And we start bringing the net in, and all of a sudden we see this huge, you know, whale out there. <laughs> and, and if he wanted to, he could just go up to the net and just blow it apart. But we decided instead of doing that, we let one end of the net go offshore, you know, let it go. And he finally made his way around, went out. And when I was really young, one time we had a caught a huge sea turtle, not one of those little turtles, but a oh, big one, yeah. Oh, no. When I was a kid, and I thought that was pretty neat, I had to take it home for a pet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that lasted for a day, you know. And, and he died? Thing. No, no, he, he was like, I had him in this huge tank, and he was oh. going wild, you know. <laughs> you, you, I you, felt bad for him, so I took him back. You, you were going whaling Ed, even if you didn't yeah, get but right. a whale a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we had sharks once in a while, and uh, one time we had a seal. You can't believe how vicious a seal can be. Oh. Because when we, we brought the bag, you know, the, old, the way, I don't know if you saw how, how the net is, like we bring both ends in, you know, and then you have like a pocket at the very middle of it, and all the fish go into that. And the seal, he went into that, what we call the bag, and, uh, he didn't want to be there. It was un unbelievable. He was, <laughs> he was father, very, very threatened by yeah, you. Yeah, he was, he was biting us and that, and my father untied the drawstring and the thing took off like crazy for the ocean mm -hmm. and running. And he went about 50 feet off and he came back up and looked at, you know, looked back at us. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just yeah. away and he took off. But I, I've had seals, was, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I've had seals in the pound nets about four or five times. And the first first time I got one in the pound net, I decided, well, I'll just lift this net up and somehow get him out of there. And I mm -hmm. pursed the net up and got him cornered. That was a mistake. <laughs> and uh, when I went to took, I was going to try to get him out. I had a big braille, and I thought, well, maybe I can get that over his head and then get his flipper or something and get him out of there or get him out of there some way. Well, you might as well have a, a wild wolf in a corner. <laughs> You know, I mean, he's he's a, he's a big, strong animal, about 200 pounds, and with quite a set of canines, and he feels very threatened by you. There's no question about that. It's a is a wild animal, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I finally had to just drop the trap trap down in the water and 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 move aside. After that, whenever it happened, I found that if I just dropped one corner of the trap into the water, just so it was under about that much, and took the boat to the other side, they would very peacefully just go out. <laughs> okay. um, Sam, what's the biggest lobster that you ever caught? Oh, um, by most stand, not very big, about four and a half pounds is the biggest. But uh, I've seen fellows that fish in the ocean here out of Shinnecock, sometimes they have 10, 12, 14 pounds. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I was six years old, I worked on a trawler, and uh, we had one that was 25 pounds. But that couldn't get in a lobster trap. I mean, even if he would, he wouldn't fit in a lobster trap. You know? I caught blue lobsters. I caught a blue lobster once, and it was one that had just shed. Uh, it was uh, fairly soft. It was a female, about two pounds. And it was mottled uh, blue and sort of a pale cream color. And uh, I brought it home, and it didn't have quite a hard shell on it. I brought it home, showed the kids, and... We took it down to the uh, Punk Park Bridge and let it go in the bay. It was about two pounds. Nice size lot. How about you, Wayne? One year, I, I caught an octopus out here in Shinnecock Bay. <laughs> and uh, my friend has a very large saltwater tank with a lot of very expensive exotic fish in it. Uh -huh. So I brought this octopus home alive, and I gave it to him. And he put it in his tank, and the next morning, 
Most of the fish were gone. The octopus uh, ate most of them. He grew quite large. He grew quite large in the tank, and uh, then he let him go that uh, fall. But, uh, I caught a small octopus in the pound at once, and I gave it to a friend with a saltwater tank. And he had a little lobster in there about that long until the next morning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this man will go. Oh, yes. I, I've also caught $20 bills in the scalp dredges. That was, that was pretty good. I, I don't know, Sam was up west when they threw all the money off the bridge. and uh... yeah, I missed out on that. Uh, there was one time, I guess it was 78 or 79, uh, someone had a suitcase full of counterfeit $100 bills. <laughs> they threw them uh, off the Robert Moses uh, uh, bridge, or the Cap Tree Bridge going over Great South Bay. And... Uh, a few of the fellows that were clamming it, they found a few floating, and they were able to pass a few off. <laughs> <laughs> they bought a lot of drinks for a lot of people. <laughs> but I missed out on that. How about other non-fish items? Have you ever caught anything else unusual? <laughs> Oh, you, uh, you catch lots of, like, old bottles. <laughs> everything, work, everything works their way down these leads into these traps. Yeah. <laughs> Water skis, garbage cans. Uh, some of the uh, striped bass, especially in the 60s, they, some of them are very huge. They, we call them cow bass, and uh, some were up to almost 100 pounds. Wow. Weight, yeah, yeah. And, you know, almost, you know, five to six feet. Yeah. Sonny Scalinger had a 90 pounder, I think, yeah. didn't he, in a whole thing? Yeah. yeah. Can we just take a look at a couple of the things that you brought? Oh, okay. Uh, you want to? Can you think okay. of maybe bring anything? This? <laughs> this is an old time clam rake. Mr. Squires knows about those, right? Uh, <laughs> Very heavy. I don't know how old. How old is this? About probably 60, 70. Yeah. Yeah. Keyboard. Keyboard, right? Uh, they're so big and heavy, partially because they have wooden handles on them, and you needed the weight to offset the buoyancy of the wood. Uh, this is what they used to use. Yeah, what, when I when I started on the bay, I had that, an outboard motor, and an old rowboat station rowboat. That that was it. <laughs> Can you now do that clam, manually? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Now the clamp brakes have evolved a little. They're stainless steel, some of them. Very light. And, uh, have more of a basket. Yeah, it's very efficient. You know, Lambs like, don't pull out the side. Yeah, they, like on, you know, really, there's no sides. Yeah, so, so yeah. They can basically pull right out the sides. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> it's big enough for me. Uh, <laughs> Scalp bridge there. Oh, Use nice. a pull two or three on each side of the boat. All right. Uh, and they kind of just like skip along. And uh, you know, hopefully I'll have I'll use these one more time. Uh, the brown tide ever goes away. But uh, you're just loose swimming in the in the water, and they get caught in the net or what? Yes. Well, so they're dragged on the bottom mm -hmm. with, with a rope to the boat, and there's usually two to three on each side of the boat. Oh, Sculpts are just laying on, on the bottom. bottom. They're on the bottom. bottom. You don't have to dig them out like They're that. on the bottom. Oh, no. On the bottom. Yeah. And this Thank is what you call a scrap rig. You get overboard. They have a long seat right here in the basket. Yeah, I've still got mine hanging on the wall on the right. And you can do it this way, but it's it's really hard on the, the arms, you know, and stuff. And over the years, we've made up this system we call vacuum belt. Uh, you know, with this type, you put your feet right in, and uh, go, you know, it fits around the back. The strap goes over your neck, and then you reattach it to the front here. And you let your, your body do the work instead of your arms. Mm -hmm. you just, you know, you're walking back, and it's a lot easier that way. This is the main way that I do climbing, I seem to. Like the best Wayne, he uses these other rigs. You know, that is for people that don't like boats for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And, uh, Remember, he sunk once. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, this gun, usually, we used to use just like a fire hose, you know, and then tie it to the chain. But uh, some guy, I guess it was from Florida, invented this, this setup. And down there, they call it a diaper. But it works really good. Save, saves your arms. You can work all day using that. How far below the surface do you Dig try to get? Yeah. Well, it depends on the time of the year. In the summer, the clams are they're right up near yeah. the surface, so you don't have to dig as deep. In the winter months, they, they really go down because they don't want to freeze you know, when it's real cold. So in the winter, you, you dig a lot deeper. Yeah. I noticed climbers in North Sea and Fish Cove, Bull's Head Bay, 10 to 15 degrees out. Wintertime, wind howling sure. sure. up to their chest in water. Mm -hmm. uh, how cold do you feel underneath? <laughs> <laughs> what are you wearing? <laughs> what are you wearing? But actually, we're, we're sweating, believe it or not. Because yeah. right? we work, you know, you, so the, you're out there and you just keep going, you don't stop. And everybody always says that to me, how can you do it? I say, you know, I was sweating today, you know, <laughs> and I can't believe it. We're, we're suited up to do what we do. We're not, we, we, we're not cold. Do you ever get sick? Never. <laughs> it's, it's true, like, you know, and if you have an office job, you run around a lot of people and have the flu and you yeah. catch cold. I haven't been sick yet this, this winter with a cold, Never just because you, you're not really in contact with mm -hmm. a lot of people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, can you tell us what Yeah, this happened? is, uh, this is what we use for Neopot nowadays. Uh, you may be out on the uh, on the bay or the creeks during the summer and the spring months, and you'll see corks floating around on the surface of the different colored corks. And nine out of ten of them have something like this attached to the bottom. And uh, the way this works is, um, it's baited in the primary bait for eel to either skimmer clams or horseshoe crabs. And uh, if you can see, there are two compartments: the front part, which is called the kitchen. And the back part, which is Kitchen called the parlor. parlor. That's right. Don't be fooled. Uh, and uh, each compartment has a door to it. Uh, and you put a piece of bait in each compartment. Some people prefer just to bait one or the other, but uh, I found it most efficient to put a little piece of bait in both, both compartments. And uh, the eels feed primarily by smell. And you try and locate the trap with this fair amount of current so that it will more or less chum them. And uh, once they get into the back compartment, you'll see there's some netting there, and it's pinched closed. It's a tight fit for them to slide through, and it's tough for them to get out. So that a trap like this, once an eel gets in there, it's, uh, it's very it's unlikely for them to get out. How do they get in the first place? The jaws aren't open? No, no, they come in through the front. Through the front. There's the front, and you'll see there's a large piece of netting over the front. That's just to prevent um, snails or fish or something that might clog the actual funnel itself from getting into the front of the front. Spider crabs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, they're made out of um, a galvanized wire which is coated with a vinyl coating so that they're basically maintenance free. When I started yelling, uh, the only type of wire that was available was um, galvanized coated wire. And what we would do after we made the traps out of that would be to dip them in tar so that the, uh, the wire would last a bit longer. But um, this trap is, oh, I don't know, four or five years old and uh, it's almost as good as the day it was built. I'd like to know how you you stick at your territory, is it by genetics yeah. agreement, or are there just a few of you, or do you have fish fights? Uh, sometimes we do have fights. You ever, you ever watch two dogs patrol their boundaries? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, to, us, to me, it looks you know, Tonight they're friends, tomorrow, we don't know. Do you, do you we, have certain we coexist. Uh, we work it out. We respect each other's, uh, you know, if, Sam's working over there. I'm not going to go over there and jump on top of him, you know, and, or if Eddie's, you know, and vice versa.
most people anyway respect. Uh, once in a while, some people don't, right? Yes, once in a while. <laughs> so. You were talking about how the yield uh, is maintenance-free, but someone referred to the fact that lobster pots aren't. Are they still made of wood? And um, I still fish a good amount of wooden, wooden lobster traps. They require a lot more maintenance. Um, just by the, the nature of uh, how you, you do go eeling, it's a seasonal thing where basically you fish for a month or two in the spring and maybe a month or two in the fall so that the traps aren't in the water for any length of time. Lobster, on the other hand, generally I start to set my gear in March and it stays there until uh, December or January. So uh, <coughs> I've just been in the water for that period of time and take a beat. I spend for each hour on the water, an hour on the shore for maintenance. For, for, you know, for the pound nets and pike nets. Between building new ones and mending, uh, you know, and maintaining old ones and new poles, it, it's about an equal equal hour, equal hour for maintenance for every hour fishing. In the fall, six or seven. In the springtime, two or three. It's different fishing in the spring. Mostly in Chinnacock? All, all in Chinnacock or Tyana. Mm -hmm. Several of you mentioned the other night some, that fishing was not just a job, but sort of a way of life. Can you comment on that, anyone? Well, well I can a little bit. Uh, when you come home from working, you know, out on the water, uh, you really never have any time uh, just to relax, because it's always like Kenny's talking about uh, fixing his nets and Sam with his pots. There's always something to do. I mean, there, there never seems to be uh, a day that goes by that you can't find something that needs to be done. And as we talked earlier uh, about about fishing being a way of life, you have to make decisions like every single day that are correct because if you don't you're not going to make any money and you're not going to survive economically I mean it's as simple as that so you know you come home that day and say you had a halfway decent day and you know you're thinking to yourself well what am I going to do tomorrow you know it never seems to leave your mind it's, it's not like having a uh, a real job quote unquote and uh, <laughs> going home and just you know throwing it aside and uh, relaxing for a while you're constantly planning for the next season you know and you're, you're constantly watching the weather hopefully about a week ahead you're trying you're trying to yeah. trying to gauge yeah. the weather a week ahead to get the things done that you need to get done while the weather's right to do them uh, during the spring months these traps have to be hung up on the poles all the webbing has to be hung up above the water about every 10 to 14 days because the marine growth gets heavy on them you know and they get to the point where they wouldn't fish at all you know and uh, that has to be dried bone dry to kill it, you know, and uh, you when the t when when the w when you get good drying days, and most people understand what they are. That anyone who ever hung laundry out, you know, you have to take it. You have to take advantage of it. And if you miss it, what could happen is you could then get a period where you you've got heavy marine growth on your nets, and then you might get a rainy period of eight or ten days, and you're out of business. You know, you must take care of what is supposed to be taken care of when it's supposed to be taken care of. You know? And that includes, of course, uh, when the gear changeover from the different things we do from season to season, is putting everything away all ready to go and, and maintained and, and keeping on top of your yeah. business. It's like, a, it's like a farmer in that respect. You know, a good farmer always keeps his equipment maintained and is always prepared for what he has to do for the next season. It's also a way of life for your entire family, it, it, not just decisions that I personally have to make, but uh, my wife and my kids, uh, their life is built around what I do for a living, mm -hmm. more so than if I had a regular job. Right. Uh, and um, the way they gauge their time and their activities, you know, they, they give consideration to how it's going to affect how I have to work, right. and it affects the whole family. Would you say that overall it's a, a satisfying choice that you've made yeah it's also when you're out there like especially with clam and it's like you just see nature and it's all its beauty you know like mm -hmm. just the other day you know when I was working in the same creek there and 
you just see deer run by, you know, and pheasants flying, geese, everything, and it's like a calming effect, you know, mm -hmm. instead of, the, mm -hmm. you know, going on Montauk Highway and fighting the traffic, you know, here, yeah. here you, you, there's like a calmness to it. I mean, you're working hard, but, but then there's, you get that benefit yeah. from it, you know, it's, it's something I, else. I think we see more beauty and variety in nature right. in one see or two years than most yeah. people see in a, in a lifetime, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, we, we see things that people never see. I mean, I, I, can, I can fall back on those memories if I get down sometimes, they can lift me up, you know, yeah. I can remember one morning in early May and getting to my fish traps and, and uh, we had a light rain and the sun, sun was coming up and we had two of the most beautiful rainbows I, I can ever remember, one above another, double rainbow, you know, and it was flat calm and that beautiful yellow light with that rainbow, a pretty morning and the, and the trap was full of beautiful weak fish <laughs> with their beautiful rainbow colors, you know. You know, and uh, it, it was absolutely beautiful, not just because of the catch, but because because of that morning. It was very special, and there are a lot of times like that. You know? And you, you need those times when you get down and things aren't going well to remember remember one of the reasons that you're there and you're doing what you're doing, and not, not just, we're fishing for dollars, make no mistake about that, mm -hmm. but we're also doing it because we enjoy being around the wild things. There's, there's also something to, like, when you lift up the rake and you have 50 or 60 clams in it, it's like, it's like, it's almost like, oh, you found gold, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it really, it gets you going. Right. It's, it makes right. you real. Like painting for gold. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Playing with a radio, a, a hand rake. Right. And you get to right. Yeah, yeah. You're a cool. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't have any regrets about what I chose to do for a living, even though I had time to talk. But, uh, one thing that I, I realize, and maybe I'm looking at the dark side of things, I don't really think there's another generation yeah. that can do the same thing that I did for a living, you know, and be able to survive. And that's kind of a sad, yeah. that's kind of a sad point, you yeah. know, when you think like about it. Like, we, we don't see any really young people getting into clamming now. It's, it's just us diehards, you know, it's like, it's, it's going to be an industry that's, Mm -hmm. well, slowly gonna, well, like Wayne says, it's going to become mariculture where they'll be farmed, you know, people have acreage with them, yeah. put their own but, seed. But with the out. algae blooms, though, we can't even have mariculture. No, yeah, that's yeah. true. Mm -hmm. Well, I could go on a lot longer, mm -hmm. but I really want to thank all of you for being here. You've certainly conveyed uh, a lot about the wonderful work that you do, and we're lucky to have you. I want to Really, thank you for being here. Well, thank, thank you for having us. Thank you. Before you get up and come in to have some refreshments, I just want to tell you that... Oysters and clams in the back No, we were pushing for that. But, um, in two weeks, two weeks from today, at this location, Eric Woodward, who is here in our audience, will be uh, giving a talk called Southampton Then and Now. He has a fabulous antique postcard collection, and he has made slides of the postcards, and he'll be putting them up on a, projecting them on a screen along with, alongside a present day views of the same locations. And I think we're also gonna have some, uh, some audio, some, some comments made by several people, including Cyrus Jagger, who's 102. Uh, uh, as we see the slides, I think we'll have some a little bit of audio in addition to Eric's wonderful commentary. So those of you who are interested, you can let me know later and sign up. And I want to thank you again all for coming. It's been a lovely evening for me. Thank, thank you, you, yes. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Somebody, there was a question, I just thought maybe...